So today we're in my garage. I wanted to show you what I do for quarantining new animals. Because if you didn't know, when you get a new animal, you need to quarantine it and test for diseases to make sure it's clean so you don't spread anything to current pets. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna test for parasites. My parasite testing kit has just arrived. It's a franked parcel or a prepaid postage parcel where I'm gonna put the feces in there and then post it back to the lab. Let's do that. So in these tubs, I have two snakes that I bought as actually a pair that have been regularly paired together over the years from someone else. I've purchased them, put them in simple, easy to observe and clean tubs. I've given them, I've given them belly heat. There's a heat mat under here, heat mat in between, and then the top one's got UV. And then what I do is I rotate them so that one gets UV for a week, the other one gets UV for a week. But as you can see, there's a, my guy there. I'll come on the side. He's honestly gorgeous, actually amazing hybrid. The first thing I do, apart from doing this disease screening and getting a kit, what I do is I treat them for mites and some parasites that are internal. What I do is I get a drug called a floxalena, a floxalena or floxana, however you pronounce it. There is two types. There's one called Nexgard that's used for dogs, and there's another one called Frontguard. Basically, what I do is I put a tablet or portions of a tablet in a mouse and then feed that mouse to the snake. That then treats them for mites. It makes their blood toxic to the mites. So anytime a mite actually, a snake mite goes to bite that snake, it kills over and dies. So what I actually do is in those first few weeks, I don't clean much at all because if I were to be constantly cleaning these animals when I first get them and I'm moving substrate around and I'm moving things around, there's a chance there that I'm moving around snake my eggs and snake mites around the room and I don't want that. So what I typically do is when I first get them, I'll give them a mouse that's been dosed, that stays in their blood and then it stays in their blood for 28 days. So basically I'll get them, set them up, feed them the drugs and then leave them because I know that any mites hiding under their scales will die because they've been, they bit to take a feed and then died. And then any snake mite eggs in their substrates or anything that they brought with them under their scales or anything like that, they will hatch out and then they'll go to take their first blood meal and bite the snake and then they'll die too. So basically what I do is I leave them and I leave it in the off chance that snake mites are in there and they're gonna hatch out and start populating, but they're gonna hatch out and die instantly. But if I were to start throwing substrate away and move things around and cleaning, I'd actually, I'd actually be at a greater chance of dispersing the mites rather than just let them be contained and let the snake deal with them, essentially, once they've got the drugs in them. Right, so we have our padded envelope that is going to be inserting all the gear into and then posting that back to the lab. Then what we have is a little container to put the poop inside, a little spoon to put, to, I guess, spoon it into the container. You seal that, pop that inside that, and then the information that I need to write down on this slip. I'm gonna have to put down the number of animals, what the animal is, when I sampled them, but I'll fill this in, pop it in the same envelope, then it's all in one thing, I'll seal it up, and we'll post it back. So what I'm gonna do is put feces from both snakes in this one sample. The reason being is both of these guys have been paired together and have bred together for multiple years. This is a pair that always breeds together. So over the years, if one of them's got anything, the other one likely has it too. I'm essentially viewing them as one entity in terms of like what the likely parasite burden will be or not be. So what this is going to cover is basically cryptosporidium, which is essential really when I'm dealing with new colubrids and like pinworm coccidia, uh, all your generic little um, parasites. Not nidovirus, but I'm not really gonna test for nidovirus. Technically, yes, there have been some examples. I think there's been some vet papers where a corn snake has contracted nidovirus, but typically it is a python virus. So we have to play our cards and play the odds, right? I only have a limited amount of money. I only have a limited amount of resources. So I have to pick my battles. And this is, this is real talk for anyone doing quarantine. Basically what you want to do is have the knowledge up here of the optimal thing to do. You need to know the optimal and then it's up to you to think, well, what's my budget? What's the things to prioritize? What can I maybe take a chance on the low percentage chance that it's gonna be in there? And you basically have to do 
within your means what you can do. But having that knowledge up there, then I keep doing the imagination. But having that knowledge, there's no downside to having that knowledge. Some people think that if you have the knowledge and you don't do the optimum, you're like a piece of shit. But in reality, you gotta do what you can, right? It's better to have the information and then think about, right, okay, so what am I gonna do? And what can I reasonably do to do things to get near that? But I know what my avenues are versus some people hate the fact that some people talk about diseases and testing because they don't want to have the knowledge. They want to deny that the knowledge even exists. So they don't feel bad about not testing. But I don't see it that way. But I'm like, okay, so that's the optimum. I know I'm not doing that, but it is what it is. And this is what I'm going to do. And that's it. I don't feel guilty about being optimized to the maximum. Just real talk. That's the way it is. Money is a thing. But in reality, the percentage chance of these guys having NIDA virus is pretty low. The main thing really is cryptosporidium. This girl, when I first got her, her first couple of meals, she regurged twice. And I was like, oh, that don't sound good. Regurging is typically a symptom of cryptosporidium. But what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to view them as one entity. That's my plan. And then if one's got it and they both got it, the best time to test is when you first get things because the more stressed an animal is, the more a virus or a parasite is shedding and reproducing because the immune system of your animal is dropped, which means that the parasite or the virus is flourishing, right? When they're calm and relaxed and stabilized, the immune system is back up here and they can get more of like a, a handle on what's inside them. So they're shedding and spreading at a maximum rate when the animal's stressed. So the best time to test is either when they're extremely stressed around sort of like seasonality and hormones or when you first get them and they've had a big move. That is a critical time to get the maximum chance you're gonna pick something up. Because then if they're not shedding at a high enough rate, you can get false uh, negatives. They can say there's nothing there when actually they do have the disease. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this guy down. Uh, we're gonna get some feces out of here. I'll show you the snake as well. He's a really cool snake. So here's the down low with my, with my Mickey Mouse hands. If they have cryptosporidium, I'm still gonna keep them, I'm still gonna keep them in this garage, away from everything else. But as far as I'm aware, the cryptosporidium doesn't pass to the babies through the eggs. And then what I can do is I can keep them nice and relaxed so the viral load or the shedding is at its lowest. So less likely to spread. And then when I produce a clutch of eggs, I'll have that clutch of eggs and I'll spray it with Lucillin. This is a completely harmless spray. It's really good at disinfecting and cleaning, but it doesn't harm anything. I can spray it in my mouth, I have done in the past. Not doing it this time, tastes horrible. Studies have shown that the hypochlorous acid in this Lucillin has been known to deactivate cryptosporidium at like two parts per million by like 50%. So it basically killed off half the amount of crypto at two parts per million. This bottle is 300 parts per million. So what do we think is gonna to happen to the cryptoocysts if two parts per million kills half of it? That dramatic order of magnitudes up to 300, I think it kills it. I think it, probability wise, it probably does kill it. But it doesn't really matter that much because I don't think as far as I'm aware, it transfers into the eggs and the babies. So they can have their babies. I will just spray all the eggs so that when they hatch out, they're not like hatching out onto a surface that's got cryptoocysts on it. And then you can have babies that raise up and I'll test the babies too. And if they're clear, they're clear. So you can have positive animals that live together in isolation and pairing them doesn't matter because they've been paired for years and if one of them's got it, they've probably both got it. They can produce babies and those babies are clean. So, and I'll only do that for as long as they show me that they're in a positive state of animal welfare. As soon as they get to the point we look at like Mella's work and I think there is a life not worth living and they're in pain or they go downhill, then it's euthanasia time. But for now, as long as they're fine and happy, nothing really needs to change. I just need to make sure that I manage the situation properly and I've got tools and my biosecurity brain on to do that. But then, like I said, it's the optimal knowledge and then you've got to think about what you're going to do around that. So this might be pretty difficult one-handed, but... We're gonna open this guy up, take the lid off. Hello, buddy. Right, so just a quick look. I fed him like a really big meal in anticipation of this. There's a big pile of feces down here, so perfect, I can get some of that. He's in here. Ugh, I'm gonna have to change gloves. Right. 
Come out, Murray. Look how gorgeous that guy is. He's absolutely stunning. Right, I'll pop that down on top of you. There you go. Sorry, buddy. Right, let's get some feces. Right, so I'm going to move your water bowl. Oh, lovely. A huge sopping wet pile of feces attached to the side of the water bowl. So, so to be honest, I think what I'm going to do is one, give this a bloody good clean. I know I gave him a big meal, but Jesus. Right, nice, that's a good amount. Mmm. Your usual feces content right here on this channel. Yeah, that's gloopy. That can go in. All right, okay, we're gonna do this go now, but really no matter what, if they've got it or if they haven't got it, doesn't really change anything for me. I just need to know so that I know, one, a reason why they might start going downhill or regurging or whatever, but I know I need to be like militant biosecurity from them with the rest of the collection. So I need to do things like work with them at the very end of the day and not with anything else, use gloves, be really good with my biosecurity and make use of lots of lucillin. But once I've got through this testing period, they're gonna go into vivariums and enclosures anyway, but I would like to know how much to invest. Do I give them nice like PVC enclosures or do I get them cheap wooden melamine enclosures that we get in the UK? Because, okay, the, the, the melamine ones are cheaper. I know that, that can never be used for anything else. It's for that. And when these die or I don't have them, they basically go on the fire, right? Yes, I believe the Lucillin does kill crypto, but there's so many nooks and crannies when you get melamine boards put together, but I'm just like, nah, just bin it. I just need to know things. Again, knowledge, and then what I'm gonna do about that knowledge, what I decide on my own collection. And that's the reality. You can only do the best you can do with the funding you've got and the knowledge you've got. The knowledge is free, you can always find the knowledge, places like here where I give it to you for free, then you can maximize what you're gonna do with the funds and the abilities at your disposal. All right, so let's look at this girl. I did feed you, where's all your feces? Unless it's all under your hide. I'm like, oh, I've got some there. I don't see any else. I'm, I'm just gonna move her water bowl. I'm gonna have a look at her. Hello, gorgeous. No need to freak out, no need to freak out. Right, I'm gonna try and get a piece down here. I think that looks usable without spilling all of this. Right, so we've got a piece there. And I'm gonna try and get a piece from down here, love, if you let me. Oh yeah, there is some. Now just pop this closed without getting poop everywhere. Please, please let me. Yummy. Yummy. I put my surname and I just put hybrid. I don't have names yet. The whole thing's got instructions, so you can't really go wrong, but the poop parcel needs to go in this little baggie. So I put the poopy end in first without touching my fingies. And then we double bag it. This goes in this one. Ta-da. Pop this back here. I'm gonna put in some links uh, some American links and UK links where you can go to get disease screening. I use the website called wormcount.com. It's pretty cheap compared to some other ones. I'll keep you updated on the results of those guys. And if this helps you, let me know down below. If you've got any questions, comment on answer, and I'll see you in the next one.